In the first presentation on stereographic projections, we looked at how two-dimensional features, planes, were, could be plotted both as great circles and as poles. But rocks can contain linear features as well as planar features, in other words, one-dimensional objects. These might include striations, such as those you can see on the photograph that decorate this fault plane. But they also occur in their own right, such as fault hinge lines, and away from structural geology, flute casts and so forth that you get on the bottom of some sandstone beds are another example of linear features. So we're going to look at how we plot lines on stereographic projections, and we'll use two methods. We'll look at lines that exist on planes and lines that occur on their own. And we can use different methods both to record them and to plot them. So let's go to our melon visualization. It's a lower hemisphere and a line in this representation, represented by this skewer, makes an exit wound, a dot on the skin of our melon. So lines in the 3D world plot as dots on the stereographic projection. So let's think a bit about how we can record lines in geology. And we'll start off with a line on a plane. So the first thing we need to do is record the orientation of the plane with the strike, its dip, and the dip direction towards a particular quadrant. So here is the orientation of the strike represented by those horizontal lines on our block diagram. So let's add a line on this plane. It could be the preferred orientation of a mineral. It could be the drag line of a sauropod tail. It could be something that represents the paleo flow of the water that deposited the green rocks. It's a line on a plane. So we can record its orientation relative to the strike by putting a protractor down on the bedding plane, on the top of the green horizon, and measuring the angle around from the strike to the linear feature we're interested in. So we measure the angle from the strike on the plane, and this measurement is called the pitch. And it's represented by that angle shown by the double-headed blue line. Simply use a protractor to measure the angular relationship. Therefore, it will have a value somewhere between 0 and 90 as you open that angle up. It's important to record which end of the strike symbol you've made the measurement from. So if we've set up a strike bar here, so the strike has a value of 288108. We've measured round from the 108 end of our strike bar, so we've measured round from approximately the east direction. And it's important to do that because there's an ambiguity here with a similar pitch, but going off in the, from the opposite direction of our strike bar. So a measurement of the blue line that runs across our bedding plane would be measured in from the 288 end. So that would have a pitch of whatever it is, 45 degrees west. But we're not worried about that one. It's the red one we're interested in. So it's the value east that we're going to use, the red line. So let's see how this plots up using the example here from a fault in the French Alps. The fault plane is very steeply dipping, as you can see there. It's dipping at 78 degrees towards the viewer, which happens to be south. And it has a strike of 108. So if we put the orientation of the fault plane on with the black symbol. The long bar represents the strike orientation. The rectangle represents the direction of dip, and we've said that the orientation of the fault plane, 108, strike, 78, dip, towards the south. And on this fault plane are mechanical abrasions, striations, which are pitching 34 degrees measured from the western end of the strike symbol. So let's see how this plots on a stereographic projection. First of all, we need to plot the plane of the fault. So we measure its strike around here. That's a bearing of 108. 
line that up with the great circle, tracing circles, and sketch on the great circle that represents a dip of 78 degrees towards the south. Let's just reorient it to make sure that it's arching into the correct quadrant. Yes, it's bowing down to the south opposite the north direction there. So that represents the ball plane with a strike of 108 and a dip of 78 approximately to the south. Now let's think about the mechanical abrasions on that, which are pitching 34 from the western end of the strike symbol. So let's mark which is the western end of this great circle. It's that end. And we can now reorient our great circle onto our tracing circles. And we can measure in from the X end, which is the western end of our great circle, 34 degrees to there. So that is a measurement around from 34 degrees from the edge of our great circle in towards the center, which represents a pitch of 34 degrees on the plane of the great circle. And let's spin it round so it's oriented relative to north. So that's how to plot a line that's embedded on a plane as the pitch of that line. And that's its visualization. So that little skewer there is poking down towards roughly towards the west there on a steep fault plane represented by the cardboard that's inclined southwards and that's the plot okay let's do another one now this time we've got a plane that has a strike of 154 dipping 42 degrees approximately towards the southwest and on it is a linear feature that pitches 54 degrees from the southeast end of that strike bar. So we measure 154 as the bearing of our strike, orient it around so that it's sitting on some great circles here, and draw the great circle representative of the dip of 42 degrees to the southwest. There it goes. Just check that it's arching towards the southwest quadrant, or we can divide our stereo net up into quadrants. There we go, We're aligned on north, and yes indeed, the great circle is arching towards the southwest as opposed to the northeast quadrant. Okay, let's clear that away. Now let's plot our line on this plane as a pitch, and it's 54 degrees from the southeast. The southeast is the 154 end. Let's look at how we're doing this. If you notice, we've been worrying about the great circles which are running top to bottom across the stereo net. But there are also another set of curves that are running, well there's one that runs sort of like through an equator straight through the middle of our pin and there's a series of other curves that run down towards the base and top of the net that form other arcs. Here's just one of them. These are called small circles and they're rather like lines of latitude. And these have the effect of where they intersect our great circle, the black line on our plot here, they divide up the great circle into degrees rather like a protractor would. Let's see how that works. So if we start at the bottom down in here and come in, that represents a pitch of 10 degrees on our great circle. That represents 20, that's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Coming in from the southeast end, of this great circle. Of course we'd have the equivalent measurements that we could have taken coming in from the northwestern end of our great circle as well. So we count in from the end of the great circle to find the pitch. Let's go back to our data then and our pitch was 54 in from the southeast end so we've measured around 54 degrees from the edge of our stereo net to find the line on that plane. Realign it to north and there we go. So that's measuring and plotting a line as it appears on a plane using the concept of pitch. But there's another way of measuring a line which does not use the orientation of the plane. 
So here is a line, and to document the orientation of this line, we need to know the amount downhill it's going and the direction it's going downhill. The amount downhill is called the plunge, and the direction is the direction of plunge. How do we make these measurements? Well, we construct a vertical plane that contains this line. In practice, this might mean taking a map board and carefully aligning it up with the line we're trying to measure and making sure that the map board is vertical. The map board then becomes a plane that contains the line we're trying to measure. So we construct or create a vertical plane that's not a geological feature but aligns with the line we're trying to measure. The strike of this constructed vertical plane is the direction of plunge measured in the downhill direction that the line points. The inclination that our line makes on this plane is the amount of plunge. Let's go to Stereonets and see how this plays out. We can go back to the line plane relationships that we've just looked at and use the orientation of our linear feature on the bedding plane if you like and find its orientation and report this as a plunge and a plunge direction. To avoid clutter let's get rid of the great circle representing the plane upon which this line occurs. So just simply put another piece of tracing paper on top, trace off the dot and the north arrow and take away the page underneath. So we're left simply with a dot on the stereo net which represents a line in the 3D world. What is its plunge and plunge direction? So we have to find, first of all, our created or imaginary vertical plane that contains this line. In other words, a great circle that's vertical that contains that dot. So spin it around to here, and we're now rotated so that the dot lies on a straight line that goes through the pin. That is the great circle. And this is the end of the great circle we need to consider. And we're going to measure in to find the amount of plunge. It's this distance here, 34 degrees. Notice this is effectively the pitch of that line on the vertical plane. So a plunge is equivalent to a pitch on a vertical plane. To find the direction, of plunge simply reorient to north and read off the bearing and it's 198. So this line that we previously plotted plunges 34 degrees to 198 and we measured that without reference to the great circle upon which we made the original measurement. And generally we can write this number like this with the plunge 34 followed by the plunge direction 198. So let's take a line away from a plane and just consider it's on its own. So here we have a line on a plane. Let's just take these planes away. So here we have a line. We construct an imaginary vertical plane, which might be a map board, and align the map board with that line that we're trying to measure. The inclination of that of our line on our imaginary vertical plane is the plunge amount. The strike of the vertical plane is the plunge direction. And as we've seen, the plunge is effectively the pitch on a vertical plane. And we record the directions downhill. Let's plot a line on its own. The line we're going to plot has a plunge of 54 degrees towards 108. So we first of all have to find the great circle that's vertical but with a strike of 108 measure around to 108 and now align it with the vertical great circles running up and down the screen. We don't have to draw it in, it's there under the net for us, we just have to count in 54 degrees and plot the dot, that is the line plotted in its own right on the stereo net. We'll just spin it around so we can see where it is. 
So there we are, that's how a line of 54 degrees as a plunge towards 108 plots relative to north on our stereographic projection. So now we've got a method for plotting lines. We can plot lines as they occur on planes, such as the striations on a fault plane, and we can plot those by measuring the pitch, in which case we need the orientation of the plane on which it occurs and that measurement of pitch. But we can also plot lines in their own right by measuring the plunge and the plunge direction. And we can plot both types of measurement on stereographic projections and therefore compare different features in different places.